bois, ce bar, là Ça bouge la graisse tout en raffermissant les chairs. C'est bon pour ce qu'on a. Bah, on a quoi Bah, 45 ans. Hé, hey, les gars oh, Ils viennent Mais oui, quelle belle prise oh, oh, ah Pardon, je suis désolé. Mais oh, quel con bah. Putain, ma salopette Une grand-mère disait, plus son pont, mieux il baisse. Hein Violette, hein, c'est ça hein Oui. Allez, vas-y, profites-en en vacances, un petit ramonage pour l'histoire de l'araignée. Oh Et donc, tu le revois quand tu vas tenir trois jours. Ça va, je suis pas un animal. Là. Oh, 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 mais Lolo, qu'est-ce que tu fous là La télé, elle est plus dans ma chambre. Éloi, mon fils, c'est Lolo. Jean-René, très content de vous rencontrer. Jean-René Oui. Alors, comment tu le trouves Jean-René Quoi, il est plouc bah, T'es pas aveugle. C'est ça, nos bureaux. Bon, c'est temporaire, mais faut dire qu'ils nous ont gâtés, hein, c'est spacieux. C'est quoi toutes ces peintures, là, par terre T'inquiète, j'ai la situation en main. J'aime bien le... Là, l'oiseau dans le ciel, là, c'est magnifique. Non, c'est une tâche. C'est vrai que je suis pas très objective, mais mon fils, c'est le futur d'humanité. <rire> Ah bah oui, bien sûr, c'est ma spécialité. Tu dégages plus fort Comment peux-tu imaginer que je puisse être intéressé par deux grandes blondes de 20 ans J'ai un deal à te proposer. changerait ta vie de merde. <rire> Hello. The lovely Julie Delphi. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm very excited. Congratulations on this movie. I told you earlier that I, I loved it. It's so sweet and it's so funny and it's a uh, it's such a I mean your your past films that you've written and directed have, are sweet and funny, but this is definitely a departure. This is kind of as you said more farcical, right? Yes. Well, I you know, I've made Um, comedies that were kind of independent film comedies and I wanted to do sort of a French mainstream comedy as a you know I, I don't know it's I've been away from France for now 25 years and I was like I had the need to go back and do a real French you know comedy so sort of reintroduce yourself to a large audience with large a large French audience and that's you know the, the, the that was kind of the goal with the film and I had a great time doing it so what was it like for you going into making a, a, a film like this having come from the the kind of work that you had been doing for so long in, in the United States as I said before I think it takes a certain amount of courage to believe in a lot of the jokes that you end up having to accomplish on a on a set like this you know I in a way the film is about a kid and his mother and I wanted to have this childish playfulness that you know the kind of jokes that makes me and my seven-year-old laugh you know what I mean like I didn't want it to be just a joke for myself because sometimes I show my films to my kid and he's like he doesn't understand anything because people are talking all the time so <laughs> they're very I much about adult interpersonal relationships yeah and it's <laughs> about like yeah and I, I wanted it to be half and half in this film there's a lot of adult stuff adult jokes that my son shouldn't even listen to And there's also a lot of really playful, kind of childish jokes that I had, you know, and in a way, it's the kind of stuff that still makes me laugh. I mean, you know what? The guy getting hit on the head still makes me laugh sometimes. You know what I mean? It's not like, it's the kind of jokes. And that's kind of what the film is about. It's like this poor man, Jean René, is being tortured by this evil little cute creature over there being my son, pr playing my son in the film. Did any of your did any of your actual real fears about raising your son go into the telling the story of this film at all? Like the way that your character kind of babies him and has sort of babied him for so long and has possibly nurtured his own sort of sociopath sociopathology. Sociopath yeah. Sociopathic behavior. Yeah. Well, you know, it's always funny when you raise a child. It's it's always tricky. It's like how do you raise a child in a way that okay, you want to give them You know, you want to give him all the love in the world, obviously, so they're confident and happy and stable and all that. But then it's like you don't want to make turn them into people that think they are the greatest thing in the world and that and there's nothing above them, you know, either. You want to teach them that there's reality and there's competition in life and, you know, there's tough things and everything. So you want to find the right balance. I mean, the idea of Violette, she probably, to start with, had a kid that had a tendency to be sociopathic and she just fed it 
every day by making him this kind of, you know, always putting him on a pedestal and always like telling him he's the greatest. And in, in a way, he grew that way. But, you know, maybe he was meant to grow that way. You know, I don't believe my son is ever going to become this. <laughs> <laughs> but also with this character, he's sort of uh, from a since he was a child, involved in a world that breeds a certain amount of individualism and sociopathology. Well, he's in like the, the fashion world. business and art world and like it's all about him and she's always probably, the minute he was, I mean, you see the painting on the wall and the minute he was like drawing a cross, she was saying, it's genius. Like, you know, she had never anything. And you're supposed to do that with a kid, but like, you know, how far can you go in putting your children? I mean, I don't know, you know, the film is, a comedy, I think that's really, a but central question for parenting. At what at what age is it appropriate to go? No, that's not that good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think you Give ever want to do that. Actually, I don't. I really believe you're not supposed to ever say that you, what your kid does is not brilliant. But there's a way to say it that maybe it's not brilliant, but it's like, wow, that's really good. Try again or something. You know, like just to get them to evolve. <laughs> <laughs> Try it again, but better. Yeah. <laughs> Without saying that, like you never want to put kids down because I have friends that are raised, raised by parents that put them down, and they're it's, they're it's the most brilliant artists that we have. No, 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 they're actually very insecure. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not an expert of parent on parenting, but I think having secure kids is better than having insecure kids. I mean, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. But he's too secure. I mean, he's reached a level of. But also, I also wanted to talk about sociopathic behavior because you know. In a way, it's easy to get rid, uh, not really that easy, to get rid of a sociopathic husband or friend or co-worker. It's never easy to get rid of them, actually. I'm, I'm making a mistake saying that. It's, it's always really hard because they are so insidious. But if your kid is like that, then it becomes a nightmare because basically the person you love the most in the world is someone that manipulates your life, and then it becomes a nightmare, you know? Well, there's a, there's a moment in the movie, and I, I don't, I don't want to give any, anything away, where the dialogue between the two of them suddenly feels like an abusive relationship. Oh, where yeah. he is manipulating her, and, and there, there's a sort of recognition eventually, and you suddenly feel like, oh, this, is, this doesn't have to be a son. This could be an abusive marriage. This could be an, uh, an abusive An abusive parent, parent an abusive co-worker, an abusive friend. I mean, I think abuse comes in many different forms, and psychological abuse is actually very... Um, it, there's very few films describing psychological abuse, which always fascinated me because people show abuse like real abuse, people being beat up and stuff, which is horrible, obviously. But, but like psychological abuse is much more common and very little is told about it because it's very subtle in a way. But I made fun of it, obviously, in the film. I mean, he's so manipulative and so evil yeah. in a way. Well, but I had fun with it. I mean, I have to say I really enjoyed creating a character that was so awful. Can I ask a question? A diff the difference between, uh, I think, as an, as an American and, 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 and for a French person, the, the relationship between uh, her and her son in regards to her sex life and the normalcy of the way that... And the way that they which, talk about sex? The way they talk about sex. Now, I was watching and I was laughing, but I, I had moments where I was like, hey, wait, am I like a prude, like a, an, a prude American? And I'm like, oh, I would never have this conversation with my parents. Or is it, because is it different in France? You know, it's I so think- so ignorant of me, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're not a prude American. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I think there's a certain part of the French population, not everyone, but there's, a, uh, you know, the, 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 the children of the May 68, people, the, the sexual revolution people. Like, I'm the daughter of two people that were part of the May 68, the sexual revolution, very, very, you know, open-minded people. And so they were with me, like the character is with a son, meaning it's, and, and I probably, you know, have this idea that it's okay to talk about sex with your parents because my parents were very openly talking about it. I mean, it was very, very funny and actually very, I have to say, quite healthy. Yeah. Uh, there was, you know, I was very aware of the danger also, so I never ended up in danger because I was very aware of it. And uh, I was also, you know, uh, I never thought of sex as something taboo or weird or creepy. So maybe that's boring, but it made me someone probably very healthy uh, in that sense. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that means. But <laughs> no, but like not very twisted, you know? Right. 
in that sense, and maybe that's bad, actually. Maybe it's better to be twisted in that sense. But anyway, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> you have a healthy relationship when it comes to sex, essentially. Yes, I have a very healthy, healthy kind of vision of it. So, um, But I find that it was very freeing to be able to talk to your parents. And I see friends of mine that didn't, and I have to say I'm probably more stable in that sense um, than they are, you know? Yeah, know. it was one of those things where but I was But it's fun also it. to have that in the film. Like, they actually talk, she talks about sex, like he's making, mentioning, you know, that probably Jean René has, is, like, whatever. Well endowed. Um, well, endowed. <laughs> <laughs> well that's, was the, that was the thing that I was wondering, because I was, I, I was laughing, and I was wondering, are they playing this up for laughs, or is this just a regular conversation that, 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 that these two are having? I think in the film it's probably a real conversation they're having. I probably, I, they probably, you know, uh, if it is this kind of people in the population of France that is like open-minded, you know, there's like uptight French and there's like open-minded French. There's two kinds, I mean, you know, there's many kinds, but I mean, there's obviously. But, you know, I have to say even the uptight French are, t are more likely to talk about sex, you know, at the table, at the dinner table with the kids. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> if, my, if my mom and dad ever. <laughs> oh, no. And then you get used to the idea of your parents having sex, and it's not so horrible. No. No, no, no. <laughs> Seriously. If, it's not that bad. I mean, I, it's, not, it's really not that bad. Yeah. No, I know. It's not that. It's I mean, I'm not imagining it. I currently regularly. am. Thank <laughs> you. Julia. Thank you. I'm just great. No. I thought, it, as a kid, I thought it was funny that they were having sex. I had a weird period. I just thought it was hilarious. I don't know why. But, like, I had a strange period between, like, 13 to 16 where I hated the idea. But then, you know, before that and after that, I was fine. Mm -hmm. You know, teenage years, you just don't want to know anything about your parents. You know? Oh, nothing at all, let yeah. alone that. You don't want to know anything. Yeah. Um, there is a, an incredible cameo in the in the film. I mean, I think it's him, right? Uh, did you get... No, it is him. Okay, <laughs> I, yeah. didn't, I, I didn't get I a fake. I'm not a fashion and art person, so I was like, pretty sure it's him. But like, it'd be weird if you're like, oh, no, that was an actor that playing Karl Lagerfeld. That was an actor playing Karl Lagerfeld. No, it's actually Karl Lagerfeld. Wow. Uh, and he's a, he's a great guy because he's, a, he's, a, he's extremely funny, extremely smart. And uh, I've known him for many years, and it's supposed to be a scene where it's a very embarrassing moment. Um, you know, he's one of the greatest icon of fashion right now, you know, alive and, and well, and, you know, and still very, and very, very productive, and has been, you know, the head of Chanel for so many years. And, um, and, uh, and he's just a great guy, and he agreed to do it. I've known him for many years, and he, I asked him, I was like, do you want to play yourself in a scene where it's kind of embarrassing? And he, he thought it was funny, and he agreed. So wow. it, was great, it was great luck, because really, I can't think of anyone else that could have done it, who's su such an iconic you know, figure of Yeah, he's like probably the most iconic. The most. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Like him and Anna Wintour or something are the two that you would get. Exactly, and Anna Wintour, I'm sure I couldn't get in touch with her, so... <laughs> No, but I definitely, no, he was my first choice because to me, he is the iconic person of, you know, the fashion world, so. Now, you said, you know, you, you'd been a part of independent film in, in American cinema for so long, and this is kind of your return to France. Was there also a part of you that wanted to prove to yourself and maybe to people that uh, know your work that you could do, not just be in, but do, write and direct broad comedy? Yeah, I mean, a side of me is kind of like, I've always made movies that did really well as an independent film, and, and, uh, and worldwide also. S the, my film, funny enough, um, probably people don't know, but they're actually, they're small release and stuff, but they get, s s my f I think Today's in Paris was the French film that was the most sold uh, for, in numbers of countries in, ever. So, you know, like, everyone see them. Like, even in countries where I'm like, who's going to want to see a film about a couple in Paris, blah, blah, you know, like in places you wouldn't imagine people want to see this film. But so in the end, you know, but it's still like independent films, you know. So release is independent. It's smaller theaters. This one was a more mainstream film, and it was very nice for me to be able to do that to, because, I don't know, it just got me to a level that I can say, oh, I can make a mainstream film and, uh, and, you know, and still people that like indie films did like this film anyway. Oh, you know I what liked I mean? It, yeah. so, so it was a mix, like I was able to do a mix of both, like touch the mainstream with keeping an identity of a, you know, more indie, you know, vibe. Did you find it uh, more difficult or less difficult doing a kind of mainstream film, adapting a little bit to the tone or uh, of what a mainstream film is or what a mainstream film is in, in your head? 
you know, uh, it was the main difference, actually. I didn't want to change too much, neither the subject matter or the dialogue or anything, but the way of filming was very different. Mm -hmm. It was much more uh, posé, much more lit, much more pretty. You know, usually I kind of like when everyone, no one wears makeup and it's like complete, you know, like natural. Go, go, go. Kind yeah, of, go, kind go, of go. And I'm always also, because I make, I, before this film, I made movies in like 19 days or whatever. You know, it's always like on the go. So everyone's like camera on the shoulder, like, let's shoot this scene. We have 20 minutes, you know. <laughs> also the urgency. But I love this urgency too. There's a side of me. But actually having to make a film that's more conventional in a way of filming and stuff, it was also really... I don't know, I found it as interesting as making a more crazy movie with like, you know, a few, a small crew and everything. It's longer hours and stuff, but it's a more, I, I have to tell you, it's, it's such a relief to not be in, in a content, uh, you, you know, like the adrenaline level on those tiny movies are just like, boop, 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 you're like, right. you're like this. You Constant know? state of whether or not the rug's <laughs> gonna get pulled out from under you or if like I know, you know, exactly. 10 days in you're not gonna be able to shoot anymore. Yeah, I know, and this film was completely different. So that was a very, you know, it was very relaxing. My God, I, I didn't know you could make movies like that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've worked with some uh, phenomenal directors uh, over the course of your career as an actress. I mean, Richard, your collaboration with Richard Linklater and Ethan yes. Hawke is, I think, truly one of the greatest collaborations cinema, cinema has. Those three films are so beautiful. Um, did you, w was working with him and working with people like that, people that gave you a sense of, uh, of, of how you could direct, or, or ways to direct, did you learn from people uh, while you were on set acting with them? You know, I, I learned, I would say, from almost every director that I worked with, and I would say even from the directors that weren't very good. I, you know, I had experience with people that you don't know the films because they never came anywhere, <laughs> came out. But like I've done a few films with people that weren't very good, and I've learned from both. Um, I learned a lot. One person was very um, helpful psychologically in helping me, and it's very funny because it, we make the opposite kind of film, and that was Krzysztof Kieslowski. Oh, wow because he, he was the first person to actually be very supportive of me becoming a director and a writer. And, um, and he, was, he was wonderful because he really, really was, um, you know, if I can say I had a mentor, which is really weird because actually what he recommended was to make movies that were true to me. So I ended up making comedies because it's true to me. So in a way he gave me advice and he was a mentor, but my cinema is completely, different and the opposite, but in a way the advice he gave me was to be true to myself. So, you know, I have, I have a side of my, myself which is comedy, you know, it's, and there's also a dark side, but no one wants to finance that yet, but, <laughs> and it's so dark. Have you pitched anything really, <laughs> have you tried to, go, have you gone out and pitched anything really dark? Actually, I'm about to do a drama soon. Oh, so wait. yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, people are seeing that the drama part is not so bad, even though it's really dark, but it's funny that it's so dark. People for, can't uh, imagine. For those who don't know, not to, I'll do the, make this very short, Krzysztof Kozlowski, who she's talking about, he, is a Polish filmmaker who's probably one of the most acclaimed. Uh, Polish filmmaker. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he did a, a Decalogue, which are really wonderful series of 10 films on the Ten Commandments. And he did all sorts of film. I did a three film colors. with him. Yeah, Three yeah. Colors. He was a really, really unique, amazing filmmaker. and um, Not very funny. <laughs> actually, very funny in real life. Oh, really? Yes. Great sense of humor. See? I mean, you'd have to have a great sense of humor to, to like be able to live with yourself, like while like making, making those the movies. decalogue. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. No, no, he was quite to... funny actually. Really? Yeah. That's so amazing. And, and he so... played Tetris all day long because he was hyperactive. Yeah, it's very cute. Like you imagine, like an intellectual kind of like person, like this moody and intellectual. And in fact, he was like really funny and playing Tetris all day long. <laughs> really. That is the most amazing thing to hear about Krzysztof Kozlowski. <laughs> I know, people are completely, yeah, but I swear I'm not making it up. Actually, he hooked me onto Tetris. It took me years to get over it because I would see the figures and like play it all day long. And you know, when you play Tetris, I mean, you see it all day long afterwards. Like you can't get it out of your it's head. It's a good thing to do while you're waiting on set though, I, I would imagine. Like, well, yeah, especially, was, on a, like you said, a movie like this where you're taking even longer to light and you're working uh, probably longer. Yeah, but I'm hours. off uh, video games, so. You're off of video games? I'm, I'm off video games. <laughs> No, I think it makes me, it makes me completely, yeah, it's too obsessive for me. I can't deal with it. 
Did you have a hard time? I mean, there's a there's a lot of talk, uh, not a lot of talk, a lot of rightful talk about women in in Hollywood and the, and the industry. After having made two independent films that were very well received, were very funny, very 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 smart films. Did you find that you had trouble still breaking into Hollywood as a as a as a female director, as a storyteller, rather than uh, an actress? Yeah, I mean, it didn't it didn't really open any doors, you know? I'm not sure it opened doors of other people or men, if there was a difference. I'm not sure, you know, maybe the fact that I made independent films, maybe also the fact that I'm French. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to make a deal out of it because things are changing and things are finally getting better and, you know, and it's moving forward in the right direction, you know, uh, for women, for minorities. I think it's it's it's... We should be in the positive, not on the negative, because sometimes people focus on complaining, but I want to focus on the positive. So I actually want to say that I see doors finally opening and, you know, and stuff. Um, and, and definitely in France, things are good for women directors. There's 25% of the directors are women, so it's actually a great number. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, I, someone told that to me the other day, so maybe I, I'm quoting them, but maybe I'm wrong, but you know, I think that's, yeah. Well, 25% <laughs> doesn't sound like a lot, I mean, it's not 50, it's a lot more than in, the, in America. Well, in America, I think it's, it was 4% and it went down to 1.9 yeah, last really year bad. or so. <laughs> really? <laughs> not to be, no, but I think, you know, it's interesting. I think, you know, and it, it obviously, you know, if, you know, the, the way things evolve is that it's going to change. I mean, changes take time. You know, I was thinking about that the other day. It's like a lot of young director, male directors, have sometimes mentors or people that, older directors that are very successful, that see themselves in them and that help them or give them advice or kind of pave the way for them a little bit. As a woman director, it's a new road. So there's no one paving the way for us. And in a way, it's a harder road because of that. But it's not an impossible road. It's just a harder road because no one is behind you saying, oh, you remind me of me when I was younger. So let me push you or let me give you advice. So you're kind yeah, of alone no one's, starting I mean, a new road. At the very least, Hollywood is an industry that needs, that as a, as a newcomer of any kind, you need help navigating. Right, yeah. and like if you don't have that person that's navigate. Oh, talk to this person; they could help you with this. Talk to this person. Hey, this is Julie. She's really good at doing this, and she lo she has a movie that she wants to do. If you don't have that, I mean, that's that's a huge issue for you. And I'm, I'm yeah. it's pretty hard to find as a female director. As a female director, because there's no women. Like I don't see any women director that could see themselves as a young, you know, as a younger filmmaker because there are no th such thing yet. You know, so I think the next generation, like they'll be hopefully. If I'm still around, people like me, helping younger director, woman director, you know, giving advice to younger woman director, and you know, and build slowly this equality thing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have some time. Uh, I think we have some time for audience questions. Hi, Julie. I'm Hi. also Julie. I nice to meet you. Thank you for uh, what you're just speaking about. It's a segue to my question for you. I am a young woman director, writer have not been able to find any mentors. So I was wondering uh, what advice you would give for my generation and how you see things evolving. What, what, what was the question? Sorry, I missed the first oh, part of it. Sorry, um, what advice would you give? Oh, what advice, advice. Yeah. Um, well, you know, to, to be, um, you know, I always say that because that's what I did and that's what turned out to work out for me eventually. It's like to never give up. And it's like this constant fight, but it's like, you know, it takes a lot of energy, and um, sometimes the reward is not half of what the energy you spend into, you know, gives you back. Oh, my English sometimes sucks. Sorry. No, English is great. <laughs> no, it's like, I don't know if I... But to never give up, you know, and, and it's hard because as women, also we have one thing is that a lot of women want to be mothers as well, and it takes so long to become a director. I mean, I just made it on time to have a kid because I became a director and poof, I made a kid because I couldn't. And <laughs> doesn't sound very romantic. No, but it's like I couldn't have a kid before I made my first film because that would have been very hard for me to make my first film after that, for me at least, because it was such a hard road. So, um, you know, but I was lucky enough to just, boom, be able to do it right after my first film, you know. 
but it's, a, it's an issue also for women. We want to be mothers, and I mean, I wanted to be a mother very bad, and I'm happy I am one. And, uh, and you want to be a director, which takes so much out of you, you know. And there's no structure really to help, you know, much. So, you know, it's a, it's a complex issue, you know, I think. But to never give up is really the, the advice. <laughs> there. I don't know what that, you know. Next question. Uh, hi, Julie. I'm a big fan of yours. You're having a really original voice in cinema. Thank you. Um, my question is, I guess, how has other directors informed your work? And then we've mentioned Clyde Slowski and Linklater. But uh, more so in like the rehearsal process and in terms of developing the script through, uh, through dialogue and through improv, because I know with the Before Trilogy specifically, there's been a lot of with that. I mean, you have a writing credit. Well, the writing credit is not improvisation. It's actually sitting down and writing scenes. I know the film seems very improvised, but nothing, not a word is improvised in the Before series. We actually sit down. Actually, we sit down, we write the screenplay. Uh, all three of us together, we bounce ideas off each other. Uh, the first film had an original screenplay written that we torn apart and rewrote entirely, the three of us. Then the second film, um, Ethan sent me some dialogue. I wrote the first draft that I sent back to the guys and then we added things to that first kind of draft that was not the final draft, but the first. And then the third film, we each time did it differently, but it's everything is written. And I have to say, in a way, um, it, it kind of made me think that it's pretty, it's good to have something very well written. And I never, even in my own films, there's, I would say 99% of it is not improvised. There's maybe 1% because my dad is in my movies and I can't always control him. So, <gasps> I say, what, directing my dad is like directing King Kong. It's like, <laughs> it's just a, another world. But um, he's such a crazy hippie anarchist that, you know, there's nothing I can say or do to control him. But, um, but usually every single word joke is written. I'm, I'm pretty obsessive on that, in that sense. And so is Richard and Ethan. So we work well together in that sense. But I, I don't do, you know, rehearsal is just to, to make it perfect, that the dialogue is perfect, you know, that it sounds completely natural. So we rehearse and rehearse and rehearse until it becomes almost natural to say it, when in fact it's not that natural because everything is completely written, you know? So the rehearsal process comes after the writing or during the writing, but to make sure that it's completely natural. Nothing is improvised. I did an improvised movie as my first film when I was like 27. It was called Looking for Jimmy. It ended up being a film which was weird. It came out in France, believe it or not, a cr the craziest film. Completely improvised. And it, it taught me something is that it's crazy to do an improvised film. Because you have a lot of garbage that you have to get rid of. You know, it's so much editing afterwards. It took me a year to edit it which I learned a lot also in that sense, you know. It's good to learn to do different process and see what works for you also, you know. Do you have a, a favorite of the Before series? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. No, to me well, they're a whole, you know, they're, they're one thing in a way, you know. Next question. Um, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I want to ask, uh, you did film like Before Sunset, Before Midnight, the three movies with Ethan Hawke. And how was that feeling when you played the same same character for uh, 19 years? And is there any different? Is there any different when you played the same character after several years? You know, you have to go back to it. You know, it's kind of like a work of. But you know what's interesting? The fact that we're writing the screenplay makes us do so much backstory work. We have to figure out what happened in the nine years. Basically, we do the work that actors have to do to prepare for a, for a film in the writing process as well. Because since we're writing it, we have to know every detail of their life throughout. So it feeds so much for the actors uh, to know where the character is at. So you go back into the character in the writing process. And usually the writing for Before sun Sunset and Before Midnight was really right before the film more or less, like the sunset a little less, but like sunrise, uh, midnight, <laughs> sorry, I get mixed up. Uh, midnight was right before, you know, we were on location writing it in Greece. <laughs> and um, we, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> the, 
<laughs> you know, it was nice. Uh, and uh, and so we um, we really get back into the character that way as well, you know. Going back to what you were saying about, about writing and rehearsing, I think sometimes people neglect to know or, or they for, don't realize that you write the script and then when you rehearse, you, you don't necessarily improvise, but you're changing lines, you're changing things to make it sound natural coming out of the actors. Like even the greatest writers, whoever you wanna, whoever they are, they sit with their actors or they listen to them say their words and modify it and change it so it sounds more natural coming, coming out of them, right? I mean... Yeah, I mean, we, when we rehearse, we see what, you know, the rehearsal process is like refining a stone, you know? making it smooth, ah, still a little thing, still a little thing, and you go, you go, you go, and you polish, 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 polish the dialogue until it's completely smooth, completely flawless, and that's the way we're able to do this 14-minute take. You know, uh, the last film we did 14 minutes, which was... So beautiful, such an amazing take. Uh, thank, yeah, I mean, thank you, but it was, it was like a lot of rehearsing and polishing, and actually, then afterwards, the way we learn our lines is separately with Ethan because we don't want to be with each other all the time so we don't lose the natural feeling of doing the scene together. So actually, we each of us have different people uh, rehearsing with us too. So it's a whole process. And we've done it over the years and I think we've mastered it because we've done it a few times now. So it's been, um, it's been great, you know. And I, I've learned a little bit about that is like I... You know, I, I, I learn also on acting and writing and, you know, but the writing process, people forget the most the writing process of ma movie making. Writing is the, 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 the base of all films, you know, like it is a bad screenplay, very hard to make a good movie, you know. Um, a, a good screenplay, you can make a bad movie, but it's, <laughs> you know, like you need, the screenplay comes first and, you know, it's funny because writers are always underestimated. I mean, you know, I've done the three. I've done all. I've done writing, directing, acting. I can tell you, writing is everything. It's the hardest too. I, well, it's I you're alone or not alone, but like you're a few people. You know, you're um, or alone, and uh, and you have to create everything in that moment. You know, that's where you create the film is the writing. And then the filming is one thing, of course, and you want to have wonderful people around you to make the best movie possible and great, do great scenes and all that. But the writing brings so much to the story, at least for my stuff, because it's so much dialogue based, you yeah. know. It's not as much, you know, big shots or anything, you know. I'll do my John Ford movie soon, but not <laughs> yet. <laughs> Julie Delby's Searchers. <laughs> Um, Lolo is playing as part of French Rendezvous with Cinema at Lincoln Center with uh, Una France, right? And you're going to be there for some screenings tonight and... Tonight. And tonight? Tonight and tonight. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Am I... Do I have another day? I'm not sure. I'm just... I'm just going where they tell me to go, so... And the film is so lovely. It's it's so funny. You did such an incredible job with it. It's so it was so so refreshing to watch. It opens this Friday, and then I think in a, in a, in a couple of weeks it in opens to some more cities across the country. In Los right? Angeles and Chicago and San Francisco, go see it. It's really entertaining, fun. It's a comedy by a woman. You know. It's lovely. It's a really lovely movie. Julie. Not that I'm like pu pushing the feminist stuff. I'm not that much of a feminist. <laughs> I just want to reassure people. No, I'm joking. But. <laughs> No, for the men, it's actually very entertaining for men, too. It's not just, you know. There's a fair amount of dick jokes for the guys. Yes. I'm let you know. Like a good amount. I, I, love, I love that stuff. Percentage-wise, <laughs> there's a, you know, there's a solid percentage of, there's, there's a higher percentage of dick jokes in this movie than there are female directors working in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Like, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.